Bring your bed. Bring your bed. Bring it. Bring it. Good evening, everyone. This is Barbara Demick. I'm just delighted that she's agreed to be my moderator, having been in Beijing for how many years? Uh, seven years, wow. which makes me a baby at China Commerce. <laughs> uh, and Yeti Epstein was 12 years in, in Beijing, so we have some serious uh, Chinese expertise in the room. So thank you all for being here. Well, I was going to introduce you as somebody who's been covering China, I think, since 1979. Right, right. It happened by accident. I was on the foreign desk at UPI, and I was trying to get to South Africa or Paris. I thought those were, I had no idea where I, would, I could go. So one day, uh, I got a phone call from H.L. Stevenson saying, Bill, we need you in Hong Kong. Edie Letter was in Hong Kong, uh, having been covered Vietnam for the AP. So, uh, so all of I went to Hong Kong, and the older, the older journalists, uh, Bob Crabb, Amy Mosby, went into Beijing. It's called Peking. They thought they were going to win their prizes for the coverage of China's rapid modernization. But nothing changed in Beijing for at least 10 years. And it was, all the action was in the south, in Shenzhen and in, in, in Canton, Guangzhou. So I ended up winning you know, an overseas press club award from Best Economic uh, Coverage in 1980, which started my long engagement with the OPC, and four, four decades. Uh, so uh, that's what started it all. Well, it's a good introduction uh, yes. because, you know, as you know, at the beginning of your book, you might be, uh, you know, I was only 12 at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you might be uh, you know, branded as a, you know, a China foe. Right. Quite, quite critical of China right. in this book, also critical of the United States. Um, the New Art of War, China's deep strategy inside the United States. Um, I thought I knew this story of what China is doing in the United States, and I didn't until I read the book, and highly recommend it. Um, I'm going to go sort of in order of what I read. Um, a stop topic that's you know very close to the news is Chinese hacking, Russian hacking, North Korean hacking. Everybody hacks us, but it seemed that the Chinese are much more strategic in the way they hack. They don't uh, put pixelated skulls on the home pages. They don't leave the fingerprints. Tell us a little bit about their hacking operations in the U.S. Well, they there are several different bodies involved in it. There's the PLA is involved in it. They, uh, unit, I think it's 61398, is located in a single building in Shanghai. They've helped penetrate the defense industry's uh, supply base. So they know all the suppliers of widgets to the company that makes them for the Navy. So they've been very active. The Ministry of State Security is probably the, the largest actor. They, they cooperate with the PLA, but the Ministry of State Security, uh, they seem to be the, the granddaddies of them all. They're the ones who originally involved the APT-10 in December. This is a case where Chinese hackers, this APT-10 group in Tianjin, were able to fool IBM's cloud computing system. They, they got past the intrusion detection systems and were able to move into IBM's system, obtain legitimate user IDs, and pose as legitimate users for a period of four years. This is incredible. IBM is arguably our one of our, our nation's most sophisticated technology players. And this group in, in Tianjin made fools out of them by getting inside their cloud computing system and hopping, hopping onto the, the servers and the computers of all the companies that use IBM's cloud computing system. And they did it for four years. And the most amazing thing is that after the, the Department of Justice and the FBI broke it up, IBM told the Wall Street Journal, we see no evidence that any of our data was compromised or any of the data of our clients. The, chi the clear and consistent Chinese pattern is they make copies of the data they want, then they exfiltrate it through the email channels and other channels. So, so they left no footprints. They left no no. Uh, and they, they didn't advertise that presence. No, they were they were invisible. So the, the the Koreans, North Koreans, of course, they were high profile. They attacked the Hollywood studios, Sony, uh, and crashed its computers. Chinese don't crash computers. They're, they get inside, they infiltrate, they get what they want, and then they leave. The Russians uh, are obviously very sophisticated. 
their emphasis has been on social media, and they may be penetrating some institutions, but what the Chinese have done has been massive, consistent, systematic across banking, telecommunications, healthcare, so many different sectors of our of our society. Yeah, that, that's something that really surprised me in the book, because you know you see the obvious targets, military, defense contractors, but they seem to be going for you know rather small subcontractors. To be right. an example, a company right. in the Midwest. Was right, that right. So this fellow I interviewed for Chief Executive Magazine was out golfing one Saturday morning, and his boss called him, the CEO of the company called him and said, you know, James, what's wrong? What's wrong with our our damn systems? He was the CEO was working on Saturday and couldn't get his email to work. So the guy out on the golf course uh, checked into it, and massive amounts of traffic were leaving this small company, about $100 million a year in sales. So where was it going? It was going to Shanghai. This is the unit 61398. So they called in FireEye, the big California uh, security, uh, cybersecurity company, and they tracked what was happening. And so they, were, they caught him in the middle of trying to exfiltrate this data. So uh, and they were able to stop them. But then the Chinese tried three more times to get back into the system after they'd been stopped. But, but why this company? You know, their, their, their targets are not at all. Well, well if, if you make, if you're, if you're here, here's a US Navy carrier, let's say, and then there are uh, Raytheon and Lockheed are the major uh, contractors, and then they depend on whole vast layers of this supplier, this supplier, this supplier. So the Chinese were down four or five levels into the Navy's supply chain and they had identified a company that made a certain device they wanted to copy so they could know what the Navy's capabilities were and so they could use it themselves. They, so they were stopped from getting the secret, the special sauce, but but not, not by much. They must they must be uh, in satellite space and in this, and submarine space. They've walked away with just tons of dual-use technology. And then there are other targets that I found very interesting, like the Marriott Starwood program. I'm, I'm a Starwood member myself. Was your dad a stolen? Well, I don't have that. You know, did they take my rooms at the, the well, they, Sheridan? So there, there, there have been three major hackings. One was uh, the Office of Personnel Management in 2014 by a Chinese government entity. They stole 20, more than 20 million records of US government employees. Social security numbers, cell phones, addresses, the whole works. Then the Marriott hack, they sold 400 million names of travelers in the Starwood division of Marriott, including passport numbers. And then the third most recent hack was Equifax. That was started by the Chinese Central Bank. They wanted to get the algorithms that we, our credit, agent, credit rating agencies, use to, to evaluate people's credit worthiness. But in the process, they got 140 million names of individuals and their complete credit reports. So if you combine what these three hacks, uh, they, they had also stolen massive amounts of health records. So New York Times speculated, this is not my speculation, is that they built a data lake back in Beijing where their Americans who are of interest to them, they can look at their financial records, health records, travel records, and assemble a portrait of, of that particular American to see whether that American is Worthy of being approached or worthy of being monitored. So if I have, if I have enough startup points, right, I can be charged. Right, otherwise, I forget. I, yeah. I suspect they're watching you for sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, something that was very interesting about the book is, I mean, you, you talk about ways that the Chinese are penetrating the U.S. that are illegal, spying and hacking. Right. But most of what you describe in the book is legal. Right. And that that was what was very interesting to me. Um, the the chapter, I think my favorite chapter of the book was about venture capital. Right. And the Chinese are you know, buying up these companies, they're going into Silicon Valley, and they're really like the most preferred investors because I think what you said is that they're not so fussy about valuations. They right. want innovations and right. they want to be at the table and hear the, the sales pitches and the technology pitches. And this is you know, their way of This is based on research by something called the Defense Innovation Unit. They dug into the subject and they found that Chinese venture capitalists, uh, as you say, uh, are not interested in big valuations or getting a lot of equity. They want to be at the table when, when the deals are pitched. They want, they want to pitch debt. And so uh, by, their, by their reckoning, Chinese-backed venture capital firms, including some backed by municipalities, backed by universities, backed by uh, different, different arms of the Chinese party state, had access to as much as 50% of all the deal flow 
uh, they, the, they saw the technology and have the capability to assess it. So the Pentagon is worried about this because the Pentagon has long assumed that they would have access to American technology before any potential competitor in the world would. And they, the American military, could develop it. But now it appears to them that these venture capitalists in Silicon Valley are, are seeing the trends in Silicon Valley before the Pentagon does. Yeah, yeah it was really it was fascinating. And there, there's a very interesting example of a company that makes lithium batteries. Right. It was A123. A123. And the story of how the Chinese acquired this company and how it, it you know, it just it makes you so angry. And it makes you angry, not at the Chinese, but, but at, the, it, at the U.S. Right, government. Right, because most right. of this is self-inflicted. Yeah, and I, 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 a great deal of this is self-inflicted. So in the case of A123, when I wrote the book, The, the Next American Economy in 2011, A123 was one of my poster boys poster children for a company that licensed technology from the university, in this case MIT, then created the company, got venture capital, got major companies like GE to be on their board, and Black & Decker was actually using their technology and power tools. The Obama administration came in and said, well, we, we want an electric car industry. So the Obama administration put money behind Tesla and Fisker, and they started buying batteries, lithium-ion batteries which is a critical technology for the future of energy. Well, American politics out of the way, and the Solyndra thing happened, and all of a sudden- Everybody explains Solyndra. Solyndra was a silicon, uh, was a solar power company in California that the Tea Party members in Congress attacked as being an example of corporate welfare. And some, somehow they got, uh, they were against it, and they whipped up a storm of controversy that forced Department of Energy people to go in and testify. So when the Obama people saw this, they realized that they had to pull back for political reasons. And as they pulled back, that undermined A123. And they ended up being forced into bankruptcy where Wang Xiang, the China's largest auto parts maker, was were able to buy them for pennies on the dollar. And I think they invested about a billion dollars and Wang Xiang got them for 170 to 180 million dollars, pennies on the dollar. So now that technology is in the hands of Chinese auto industry. So, so we, we were just, we had had a problem in this country about how do we think about developing technologies? What is our policy on that? If people are against it, say, well, you're picking winners and losers. You're, you're, you're interfering in the free marketplace. Uh, so there, we, we uh, just have not been able to overcome this ideological argument. I mean, you have a, um, there's a line that uh, really struck me. In the, the book where you say it's the very porous nature of American democracy that allows the Chinese strategy to work. Right. You know, they're right. sort of beating us at our own game. They're taking advantage of you know the open markets. They have a very deep understanding of how our system works. I remember 15 years ago meeting a guy, a Chinese guy, who knew how to register a company in the Bahamas and do a reverse takeover of an American listed company. I mean, they, they understand our system so so well. Uh, far better than we understand their system. So they are able to to manipulate some of these institutions. Uh, Hollywood, for example, Hollywood Studios uh, want to sell in China. So Hollywood Studios won't entertain any plot that portrays Chinese in the negative light because they can't sell that in the mainland. That turns out to be a more effective device than actually buying the studio because the Americans are self-censoring. So uh, universities are co-opted because they're getting money from the Confucius Institutes and other uh, arms of the Chinese government. And then when one of their professors has said something critical about China, and he gets banned, and like Andrew Nathans at Columbia, who I interviewed for the book. So does, what does a university administrator do when one of their professors has been banned in China? Do they say, we're not going to do any business with you? Or are we going to stop taking Chinese students? No, not, not a single university has, has retaliated against Chinese authorities for banning one of their professors. In other words, American universities are taking the money and agreeing to compromise their academic freedom. It's, it's actually quite shocking. They never protest. Do they? No, no. And a lot, so many universities now have campuses in China, and you know, certainly everybody has um, you know, a large number of Chinese students. The 350 to 360,000. Uh, the Chinese students at American universities. And so on the one hand, this is tremendous benefit for state-owned universities who have budgets getting cut or smaller universities whose funding is drying up. 
Uh, and these Chinese students as undergraduates work very hard. And they're very sophisticated about the technologies in particular, the STEM, the STEM fields. Uh, and so it's, it's been, where it gets sensitive is that some of these students go off working in at Berkeley or University of Maryland in advanced robotics or advanced materials. And they, they have cutting edge knowledge. So some of them are recruited to go back to, to China. So for example, Li Yuan works for the New York Times now. Uh, you know the name Li Yuan? Yeah. She now, she worked for the journal at the time. So she went to an event in Silicon Valley where the head of China's semiconductor industry, the man charged with developing the semiconductor industry in China, came to Santa Clara on the, foot, on the, on the doorstep of Intel and gave a, a presentation to 300 Chinese speaking students and researchers about come to China, we'll triple your salaries, come, come back to China. So the people involved in the state-directed programs in China are coming here to, to lure back the talent. Others go to work for American institutions, and they may make genuine contributions forever for their entire life. But a small subset are get approached by the Ministry of State Security, and they say, you're going to have access to this technology. Uh, we want it. And, uh, and because they have family back in, in Beijing or China, the Chinese government is able to force them, in effect, to do that. So one case in particular was that of a Ministry of State Security official, Mr. Xu, who was in contact with a GE employee in the Cincinnati area who had secrets about how carbon fiber is used in the jet engine blades that General Electric makes. And he flew the young man to China. They had some nice exchanges. And he kept pumping him for email, by email, for more and more details. Finally, obviously, the young man in Cincinnati started working with the company and said, I have a problem. The company called in the feds. So the young man in Cincinnati said, I'll meet you in Brussels. So the top executive of the top official of the MSS flew to Brussels. The Americans were waiting and arrested him as he tried to get these secrets about uh, carbon fiber technology, UG gen engines. So the 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 key body involved, it's clear beyond a shadow of a doubt that official bodies in China are involved in trying to get access to technology from Chinese or Chinese Americans working in American companies. Mm -hmm. yeah, in, in some ways, uh, again, as I was saying, I was like less shocked that the Chinese are doing that, but, but more upset that the U.S. is making it so easy. Right. And right. I mean, you know, there's, I don't know, was it Michael Kinsley who said, you know, the most shocking crimes are the ones that are not against the law. <laughs> uh, you know, you look at the situation for these students who come, you know, from China, they major in STEM, they're excellent students. Um, you know, given the immigration policy of this country, it's difficult for them to stay. They're Chinese, they get good jobs, good job offers in their home country, in the fields that they've studied. Um, you know, is this kind of technology transfer? Should we be doing something differently? Because you can't really blame these students. No. You can't blame the people who are hiring them no, either. No, it's, it falls within, that's fair game. If you send students to another country to study and you can persuade them to come home, that's fair game. I mean, Indians do it, the Israelis do it. What's different about the Chinese program is that it's organized in the, the Thousand Talents program. It's organi organized and systematic. But the, the, can you explain more about this Thousand Talents program? Well, they, they've identified the talents they need to achieve their Made in China 2025 vision. They also have a variety of five-year plans in different technological fields. So they, they, it's like hiding in plain sight. They have announced what they want, what they want. and they are going after it by then uh, trying to identify people who have skills, Chinese people and, and Western people, who have these skills and who can then be brought back in to fill specific needs in these industries in China. We, we do it as well. We send our students abroad and we, they come home. We, we may benefit from the knowledge or the experience they've achieved, but we don't do it in any kind of central government directed way. We do it in a much more open market way. I mean, our whole concept of open scientific research is at risk. The NIH, NIH case, may I mention that briefly? Yeah. NIH, as everyone knows, National Institutes of Health, spends 39, 38 billion dollars a year of taxpayer money conducting research in bio, biotech and other areas. So they have a process called the peer review process. If Barbara has an idea and she, she sends it to the NIH, 
and NIH sends it to professors and other people in her given field uh, who have expertise in that to evaluate it. Well, some of these people that they've been sending the, the, uh, re the proposals to for review have been Chinese or Chinese Americans who then take the ideas contained in those, those pitches, those, those, um, you know, those uh, uh, what am I calling them? pitches, proposals. And then opening up shadow factories back in China to try to take advantage of that content within those proposals without telling anybody. It's doing it secretly. So this, this story broke last summer. So how, what is the NIH supposed to do? How can, how can they walk away from their open scientific review policies? How can they tighten that up? It's going to be very, very difficult for them to change their whole research model because of these, this abuse. Exactly. Right. I mean, our whole model is predicated on yeah. certain certain values of openness and trust. Yeah, and, and also outsourcing. I mean, all our technology is outsourcing. I mean, how many how many iPhones are in this room? Right. Yeah. You know, they're all it's all basically made with Chinese components. Well, the Chinese value added is maybe ten to fifteen percent, and a lot of the value added is Japanese, Korean. The Germans make the cameras, so uh, so. It's, it's, they've created this global manufacturing platform uh, where they supply the labor and they create the supply chain, but the, the majority of value added in an iPhone is not Chinese content. You, you mentioned that there was this chip right. that uh, had been added in by the military and it was it found in a lot of products. Can you this is, this is a Business Week story. Uh, many of my colleagues from Business Week are here. Uh, they started when Amazon wanted to buy a company in Oregon that made software that was able to, to analyze large video feeds. You imagine it has military implications as, as well as any uh, implication. And so they were using uh, servers made by Supermicro in California. So Amazon uh, bought one of these servers and had to analyze. They had it sent to uh, Ontario, where a firm took it apart. And bit by bit by bit, and compared it to the schematic, the diagram, the, the specifications, the original specifications. And they found a chip the size of a grain of sand that had been installed in these uh, the super micro servers were sourced from China. So these, the PLA had figured out where the servers were made and gone to the factories and had, had, had forced, obliged the manufacturers to insert these tiny chips into the uh, motherboards and these motherboard these chips gave the, ch the PLA the power to take over control of the motherboard if such a, a time would come. There was no evidence that they actually took control, but that they were preparing to. So these these devices made by Supermicro were in use in the U.S. Navy, both houses of Congress, uh, Amazon, uh, Apple, Apple uses them. So uh, so th there's been. Uh, it's never been proven, and only Business Week reported it. Having worked there for 11 years, I don't think Business Week could have made that up. It's too wild to be just made up. I, I think there's, I think that the Chinese have surprised the American experts I talked to about the level of sophistication that they're displaying in information communication technology. They're just, they have, they have moved ahead rapidly. Uh, you, you bring up an interesting issue of, of also. You know, with regard to Chinese scientists at American universities and government, you know, are we in danger of starting some sort of new red scare where you know, Chinese nationals or you know, ethnic Chinese well, are suspect? There are four million Chinese Americans, so that, that's that's one of the most sensitive aspects of this whole subject. Is how can we uh, attack the these abuses that are clearly occurring without turning it into a red scare? or an anti-Chinese vendetta? My, my answer is that there are many Chinese Americans who understand the pattern of what's happening better than we can and can identify it and, and flag it so that we can stop the penetrations before they disclose uh, sensitive information or before uh, the cat gets out of the hat. One example is Chinese Americans working for American news organizations. They've been very, very smart, and they understand the pattern better than we do. So Amy Chin, writing for the New York Times, is, was the first one who explained about the Chinese government blackballing Hollywood studios who used um, um, 
Brad Pitt, because Brad Pitt made mm -hmm. the movie seven years in Tibet, uh, and was Li Yuan of the now New York Times, who has written so persuasively about Huawei and why they are, in fact, a threat to our, our national security. So if we can persuade Chinese Americans uh, to become part of an effort to check these abuses, then that's a win-win. That, that's a positive strategy. But you know, what, what about the way this system is? I mean, so many um, graduate students in the STEM field are ethnic Chinese or Chinese nationals. Are we bringing in too many Chinese students? And you know, should our tax exempt you, you know, institutions of higher learning be educating Chinese nationals? I mean, this, this, this is a very sensitive issue. Right, I mean, I mean there's a lawsuit pending in Harvard saying Harvard discriminated against Asian Americans. So, because there are too many of them. So, uh, I draw a distinction between an Asian American and a Chinese nationalist. I think that we can gradually uh, embrace the different sets of policies for people who are foreign citizens as opposed to people who are American citizens. But it's extremely delicate, extremely uh, sensitive because the Asia Pacific, the Asian American political caucus in Washington, who wouldn't even talk to me for this book. They're, they're, they're sure to say that any movement in that direction represents a direct assault on all Asian Americans. Well, there are, there are also many Chinese nationals in the United States and Canada who feel threatened right. by the Chinese government. And you mentioned this in your book, people like Rose Tang, who spoke here right. a few weeks ago, right. uh, people who participated in the 1989 democracy movement. There was a kind of war going on all these 30 years after Tiananmen. The Chinese government is still pursuing uh, these people who survived and denying them contact with their families in China, uh, harassing them, their communications, approaching them with agents. Uh, and we flew Uur Kai Shi from Taiwan here for this event a month ago. He could not fly on a Chinese na national airline because he's black blacklisted. He had to fly on a Taiwan airline to get here. So the Chinese government is engaged in a, a, a kind of war here on our soil against these these survivors. It really is amazing. Anyway, I will um, um, sort of end with, you know, we're actually um, talking around the main subject in the news, which is Huawei. Right. And I think this is just, you know, a, a great case study um, in a company that may be uh, subverting American interests or maybe not, but at the same time, Huawei's technology has proved to be vital in internet systems in the right. mid, fifth generation, 5G. Yeah, and you're you know, seeing these stories that a Huawei is banned. You know, there's a lot of communities that will suffer. Right. And you know, maybe you can talk a little bit about that situation. Well, this is a case where uh, the Chinese state-run system, state-owned enterprise system, has surprised us with coming up with a, an advanced technology that we didn't really have, we didn't really think that they could do this. So they're trying to do this across the board, quantum computing, supercomputers, on and on, artificial intelligence, on and on. They are trying to use their considerable wealth and, and legitimate uh, expertise as well as stolen expertise to leapfrog us. They are attempting to leapfrog us. So here's a case where they've come up with a technology we have no answer for. We, we were caught sleeping, in effect. This is like Sputnik in the 50s, in my mind. That here, come, here they come with 5G rolling it out around the world, and we don't have an answer to it. The only other makers of these systems are Ericsson and Nokia. So, so what what can we do? Well, so the Trump administration is fighting what I would call a rear guard action to tar them, to arrest Ms. Mong in, in, in Canada, to uh, whip up the case in Seattle about T-Mobile, to vilify them, to put a diplomatic pressure. But it begs the question. Of what are we, how are we going to develop our own technologies so that we're not surprised by further Huawei's? Are, are you suggesting that what the, what the Trump administration is doing is really sour grapes, that they don't have a legitimate case against Huawei? Well, I think they do have a legitimate case in the sense that if it's, it's, a, it's a PLA outgrowth, uh, if the Chinese government were to ask Huawei to tap a certain set of records or, or a certain network, there's just no question in my mind that they would do it. The Chinese passed a law couple years ago that say any Chinese entity operating anywhere in the world, if asked by a Chinese government uh, agency for assistance, they, they have to render it. It's a matter of Chinese law. And I think a matter of 
of, uh, you know, they, they share a common cause. So I, I, I agree that it poses a, a threat, but the, the, the burning question in my mind is, how do we organize ourselves to prevent more of these from happening? Well, that's the question. How? I don't know. Well, in my book, I say that we need to harden, first of all, harden our targets, but we need to get serious about what are our, our technology policies? What are the relationships between universities, uh, the money people, governments? How do we, how do we jumpstart our, our commercialization of new ideas? Right now, I'd say we still are best at coming up with fresh new ideas, the cutting edge, bleeding edge ideas. But it takes us too long to develop them because of access to capital, of our, of our, our system is not as fast as the Chinese system seems to be taking these ideas and blowing them up, making them happen. And what about American companies who, that are working in China? And there's been a couple of examples lately of the American companies that have been um, involved in building these detention camps in Xinjiang, right. and, um, you know, do, doing a lot of things that you know, we may not approve of. Well, if the if current trend lines continue and the narrative continues to get built that we're engaged in fundamental confrontation with China, uh, that they have been built as an authoritarian state and extending it around the world, and if this narrative continues to build, the pressures on Intel are going to be considerable. They spend, they sell more semiconductors in China than they do in the United States. Pressures on Apple are going to be intense. Uh, Nvidia, other companies that are selling directly into the uh, surveillance uh, capabilities that they're building, uh, are going to come under pressure. So the whole American semiconductor industry is right now sells 11 billion dollars a year of chips to Huawei, right? So if, if that shuts down, then uh, I mean, we're going to find our high-tech sector is, is getting caught in between. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems like it's kind of too late. You know, we're, we're shutting the door after the horse has escaped or, right. you know, it, and certainly, you know, my impression when I was reporting in China was that um, American companies were not really, you know, quick to embrace human rights or democracy concerns that you know, they were just really in it for the money, money, money. And even when they were exploited, when their technology was stolen, they were very unwilling to speak up. Right. They're, they're, they're caught in a very tough spot. Uh, and uh, we Americans, including our corporate leadership, uh, didn't see this coming. We were somewhat naive. We thought that the Chinese would gradually embrace our Western values. And they weren't going to kick the Communist Party out, but they were going to embrace some pluralism, some blossoming of civil rights, some blossoming of human rights, and that gradually China would fit in, slot into a world order that was established after World War II. But the Chinese are clearly demonstrating that they have their own agenda, they are trying to slot us into their world agenda, their world order, uh, and that they don't respect our institutions or our values. So, and so now, and this, I attribute this largely to Xi Jinping, so now that he is now a uh, ruler for life, or as long as he chooses to be ruler, uh, these pressures are going to build on American business to decide whose side they're on. I, I, I would dare say that they're on their own side, or on the side of the shareholders, uh, you know, with that pressure right. from the U.S. government. They're not going to really pull back. It's very, it's very difficult. I mean, what would happen if? Uh, there was a campaign, a human rights campaign against uh, Apple or Intel. And so shareholders, the sisters of uh, good charity, sue companies that we can no longer morally support a company that does these things. So there could be, it could merge as a major issue in, in boardrooms. Yeah, although it, it, it amazes me how much it has not emerged as a major issue in right. boardrooms. And you know, certainly those of us who were you know, reporting in China we, um, wrote quite a bit about Foxconn. Right. Taiwanese company that's uh, you know a big supplier to Apple, right. which had a lot of um, worker suicides, and right. you know there's they seem to go through the motions of expressing concern, but not much changes. No, not much changes. Anyway, um, I think I'll open this up to questions. Right. Right. Or, ready? Maybe, 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 maybe letter or AP. I can introduce her. When did you say you last went to China? 1978. Well, I was lucky enough to be 
posted to China in 1978 when Deng Xiaoping opened China to the West. And that's where I met Bill, because I worked for AP and he worked for UPI and our offices were in the same building across the hall. Sun Tzu Sing Naha. Sun Tzu Sing Naha. Right. Um, I would like you to look ahead 10 years to 2030. And I say this because the UN development goals for um, the next 15 years, which were started in 2015, end in 2030. And this, these goals include the transfer of technology, gender equality, eliminating extreme poverty, um, health care, and I would like you to look at how you see the world, particularly the um, great um, pursuit for greatness by China as compared to um, the U.S. belief that it remains the global superpower. And I say that as someone who covers the United Nations and hears all sorts of diplomats saying that that's not true today. I would say the Chinese are on the move globally in a way that, that, surprised, that is surprising to American leadership, that they are making massive loans. Uh, $60 billion they lent to uh, Maduro in Venezuela, $60 billion. So that alone explains why he's been able to endure the American campaign. Uh, the Russians and the Cubans are in there as well, but the Chinese are throwing around money on a massive scale. They are their One Road, One Belt initiative. Uh, they are finding countries that need uh, they need help, and so the Chinese are saying, "Here, have these billions of dollars, and we'll uh, we'll we'll build the port for you in Sri Lanka." They they bought in the Chinese workers, built the port. The Sri Lankan government couldn't repay it, so now the Chinese take control of the port. They now have taken control of ports or have interest in ports all the way from China into Greece and Italy. That's the most uh, particularly surprising thing that's happened is that Greece and Italy now have become part of the One Belt, One Road initiative. So there, there is a, a global competition taking place between our vision of a world that uh, uh, respects women, that has respects human rights and, and is open for democracy, versus the Chinese vision of the world that is one ruled by dictators backed by their telecommunications and their voice recognition and their face recognition systems backed by their billions of dollars, backed by their ports and their railroads. So they have a fundamentally different vision of what they're trying to achieve in the world. We, we need to, to recognize that, that it, that it is a different vision, or we are going to be blown away. Um, Tim Ferguson. Hi, I'm Tim Ferguson. I'm a business journalist with a long interest in Asia. Uh, Bill, you obviously talked to a number of sources and consulted other material for this. Were your sources of one mind on this, or did you have to resolve significant differences to reach the point of view that you did? Well, um, I went after people who had opinions, of course. Uh, so I spoke to former FBI people, former CIA people, former Homeland Security people, former National Security Council people. So I, I found people in the newspapers who had been quoted after recently after leaving government. Then I approached them and applied my normal charm and was able to get them to talk to me. So I knew sort of what their frame of mind was and what their point of, point of reference was. But uh, so far, I've not had anybody stand up and say, you got the facts wrong. Uh, nobody, nobody is arguing with me on the basis of saying, you got your analysis wrong, you got your facts wrong. I look forward to that that moment when somebody is able to stand up and, and, and do that. I'd like I'd like to hear that. But the opinion in in American intelligence and security and defense circles, not the political sector, but 
the security, defense, and intelligence sectors is clearly in line with my thinking. Ian Williams back there had his hand up. Ian, go ahead. And then Guy. Hi, um, but having a big caveat, I think George Orwell said there's almost never a, a war or a combat in which one side isn't better than the other, no matter how marginally. I mean, a lot of what we're talking about here, can we who unleash Stuxnet on the Middle East, right. can we who have spied on everybody else, who have got propriety spyware going throughout the world, we who have supported dictatorships, kleptocracies across the world, really sound that morally superior? Because I'm agreeing that Chinese are probably doing these things, but aren't we? I mean, well, this is what I wouldn't if you checked it out. Just how much of this is reciprocal? And, you know, if it comes to that, who we like to win, one of my friends and my former landlord, in fact, Michael Kobrick, is in a Chinese shape at the moment as a hostage. So, you know, I'm, I don't know which side I'm on this one, which side I want to win. I don't want to be a hostage in the Chinese chair. But you went, uh, you went to China again, they locked you up too. But, so the NSA clearly was involved in China. Edward Snowden revealed, uh, and recently, since publication of the book, the uh, article appeared in the New York Times suggesting that the Chinese saw what the NSA was doing inside China and were able to, to obtain some of the tools that the NSA was using. So I, I think it, what's different now is that they have part of their systems and we are, we are in a relaxed mode, relaxed mode. And so now they're on the offensive, they're on the move, we are on the in, in a defensive posture. So uh, I'm not claiming any moral superiority, it just is a matter of, of the facts of who seems to be winning in the intelligence wars. The CIA, for example, according to the New York Times, David Sanger, the fact that all their employees and operatives, their names were disclosed in the Office of Personnel Management Hack, that they're not able to put their people on the ground in China, according to the New York Times. I didn't make this up. So clearly, the Chinese have gained in the overall intelligence wars at a time where we've been compromised. Our CIA system in China was rolled up in the year 2000 and 2011. The FBI was penetrated by Joey Chun for 10 years. He fed secrets off to the MSS about FBI surveillance targets and FBI surveillance techniques. So we may have started something, but they're currently winning it, in my opinion. But I, I'm sorry, I'm just going to interject something here. I mean, a lot of it seems to be, you know, America and these endless wars, you know, where the United States is, you know, clamoring to get, you know, everybody to come fight with us, put troops on the ground. Right. The Chinese are essentially saying, you know, get rich with us. It's a much more right. appealing message. Right. And, you know, you see a situation, this is not in your book, you know, so like, like in Afghanistan, where the U.S. has spent, you know, untold billions in this occupation in Afghanistan, and then the Chinese, you know, go in and buy up the copper mines. Right. You know? And it's like, you know, you can't blame the Chinese for doing it. No, no. Own. They have, they have a, a very rational approach. They know yeah. what they're doing. They're building ports and railroads and securing access. To raw materials and access to markets, it makes perfect sense. I mean, a lot of it is they're doing the same thing as us, but just doing a better job of it. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, so, Gotti, I think you were next. Gotti. Gotti. Gotti gets a workout doing this. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. I think it's an important book and a great topic. I have to be, I'm in agreement with you that, uh, that it's long past time to face up to the challenges that China, face, that China presents um, on, on a number of these fronts. At the same time, I do worry, uh, to, to the point of Barbara's question earlier, about the potential for another red scare. And your um, uh, your answer on that question also like kind of, I didn't quite ask the ways that I considered. You're talking about putting a lot of responsibility on Chinese Americans, which sounds like, you know, we could, that, although well-intentioned, I think, could kind of go into the direction of uh, assessing Chinese Americans, you know, for loyalty or whatever, which is obviously, you know, that's, I think, beyond, beyond the pale. Right, we, we, should and, not uh, go, we should not do that. Yeah, I'm just wondering whether, and also, like, for instance, the Bloomberg story, it has not been replicated elsewhere. I don't know what the Bloomberg Business Week, right? yeah, the Bloomberg Business Week story uh, about the hack on the motherboard 
Um, hasn't been replicated elsewhere. It's it's the kind of story that you would expect. I mean, I'm not saying it's not true, but it hasn't. You know, there's some very good reporters mm -hmm. who've not been able to. This is the economist complaining that they can't get the same story. <laughs> no, well, and I haven't been involved in our uh, coverage of that. Um, so I'm actually speaking more about you know New York Times, Washington Post, to all the great reporters in this area. Um, so it's more like we have to be careful about we kind of sort of measuring our uh, measuring what the threat being being measured and identifying what the areas of uh, vulnerability are, uh, what the vectors of, of risk are, um, and kind of being kept very careful about naming what the threats are, right? And I think that's that's a very important kind of component of how we deal with this if we want to avoid another red scare. I was wondering if you could maybe expand on your earlier. Well, I spoke to several people about how how can you as a government institution or as a company, you have Chinese employees. We know that some Chinese employees have been unfairly accused. We know that's happened. What kind of systems can you put in place? Uh, so one of the FBI guys I spoke to, he had been in the Civil Rights Department at the FBI and also in drugs in many different sectors. So he said it is possible to have programs where you evaluate your, your technologies. What's at risk? Evaluate the people who have direct proximity to that. And, and do, a, do an evaluation of your points of vulnerability without turning it into a witch hunt for Chinese. I mean, there could be Americans or other nationalities who are equally vulnerable. So, so I, and I, a major American company also told me that, without wanting to be quoted, that it's possible to have training programs, evaluation programs of your internal people, and that you are able to create systems that safeguard your secrets without targeting a particular ethnicity. So that's the goal. The goal is how to get smarter about protecting our technology, uh, defending against insider threats without targeting one specific ethnicity. That's the goal. Um, I think we were one, two, three, four, and then that will be it. Yeah, at least one. <laughs> um, Hey, uh, you know, we, we sort of opened this conversation talking about uh, some of the threats to data, like like the Starwood guests, and I wonder if you could just kind of tell us what's at stake there. Is it is it more of a threat that they're collecting a, a large swath of data, or that particular individuals are being targeted for something or not, or you know, because obviously it's not like like we're invading anybody's invading Silicon Valley in the classical sense, right? So. So what exactly is it for, what exactly should we be afraid of when, when something like that is breached? Well, that's the million dollar question as Andrew Grago, the former uh, cybersecurity chief at the National Security Council told me, he's now at Stanford. <laughs> so he said, we don't really know what they're doing. There are several possibilities. One is uh, observing patterns in the United States of Chinese dissidents or Tibetans or Taiwanese or others meeting with American agents, American influencers, that they can they can track some of that activity remotely. Another is that they can take your financial records, your health records, your travel patterns, and create a profile of you to see, well, is he have, having an affair with another person? Um, is he is he overwhelmed with debt? Is he uh, why does he uh, you have a particular program of getting on the internet on the Tor browser, say? A certain hour of the night. What's going on with this individual? And so, if you're an individual, they, they clearly have the capability of mining these different data bases, data pools, to collect information about specific individuals. That's everyone agrees they have that. Now, how are they using that? We have no idea. But the capability is, is a strategic capability. It is not a fraud capability. This massive amount of data is not getting flooded onto the dark internet where fraudsters are picking it up. And using it to charge make <coughs> charges on people's American stress cards, it's being used, we think, in a, in a strategic sense. Thank you. You spoke very briefly about the BRI, the Belco Initiative. Right. Uh, do you think it's that's controversial in Malaysia, isn't it? Sorry, that's controversial. It is Malaysia. Right. Well, Malaysia has signed. Uh, 
renegotiating. But I don't want to go into that. My question is quite different. Would you see that as a Trojan horse, as some countries are projecting it to be, in, in an attempt to acquire technology and also tighten the grip in security context? I don't see a technology angle there. I don't see that they're getting access to Sri Lankan technology or like Laotian technology or Malaysian. There's not really a technology grab. It's a grab for railroads and ports and mines markets uh, for telecommunications, among other things. So it's an, it's, it's an attempt to build a Chinese sphere of influence that operates on the basis of Chinese rules. So uh, it, it's, a, it's an ability, it's an effort to project power into the world. I mean, there's just no other way to look at it. In my view, they are projecting Chinese power in the world to create a, a, a zone in the world that operates on the basis of their rules and their values. Would you have a follow-up? Does that answer your question? Well, I, I wish you had also talked about the security angle. Yeah. Because you were telling me or saying that this does have, a, a, it's an attempt to extend the sphere of war. Well, clearly, clearly, if the Chinese secure control of a port in Sri Lanka, right next to India, that has, that has obvious military and naval uh, implications. The Indians see it that way, I know. So yes, there is, there is a military uh, component to this. Not exclusively, but it does exist. For instance, in Djibouti, uh, in Africa, it's it's a predominantly Chinese port. Right. You might be the Africans over there. Right, and it's located only a few miles from a U.S. port, U.S. facility. Yeah, Jeff, you have a Hi, I'm conflict of interest. And I'm Alan Dodd Swing, an old friend of Bill's. And uh, I've already read the book, and it's terrific. It's the best book ever. And uh, for the first time, I actually went on Amazon and reviewed the book. Uh, and so I'm urging his other friends in this room to do the same. My children, my grandchildren will thank you. Now, uh, <laughs> you may have already answered this question when you answered Edie's question. But if you just had two minutes with Donald Trump, what would you tell him is the most important thing about your book? It would take a lot more than two minutes. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you that, man, we're talking attention span. Yeah. <laughs> I'd say, Donald, you, you have a problem that you have not yet begun to wrap your arms around. This is deeper than sitting down and negotiating with, with Xi Jinping. Yeah. That, that you're, you're, it's going to require sustained policy changes in the United States, sustain changes in our foreign policy activities to create a stronger American uh, base, technology and, and, and computer base to project the, va the values in the world that Americans are known for. So uh, I think that's about where the lights would go out. So uh, I mean, one thing he might understand is the need for greater computer security, that our systems have been penetrated and compromised. He might get that part of it. But then, what it takes money to fix these systems it takes person personnel. It takes kids with stem cell stem not stem cells stem education. So would he make a major effort? Would he declare a race to the moon, a, a a Manhattan project to secure America's computer systems? Maybe, but uh, I'm not holding my breath. So. Betsy Ashton on um, with the Deadline Club and with Salarians and formerly CBS News. But I now do my own projects with art and journalism. Um, Portraits of Immigrants is one of them. We have some Chinese Americans in there. Uh, but I will tell you, I wish you had read this book 30 years ago. It really troubles me. It's all about the money. We've been spending it on wars. They've been sucking it up with all the manufacturing. Uh, and it's about the will. I saw, I had a house in Antigua, a little tropical island. Uh, in the 1980s, and the peak coming in with the Chinese, because all of these little banana republics are pathetic governments, and they needed money, and the Chinese built the hospital, the Chinese built the little bridges, the Chinese built the roads. And you know what the Chinese did at that time? They were building a chain of these little islands, what's close to the Panama Canal? Mm -hmm. They think strategically. Correct. They could close off the Panama Canal to us right now if they wanted to. They think about that. And 
my best friend down there who was the US consular agent and I would just keep saying, why isn't somebody reporting on this? Why well, doesn't anybody see this? As I say in the book, we are a short-term tactical nation. We think about the latest polls. Are the polls up today or the polls down today? Where's the stock market? Stock market up, Next stock quarter, market down. Right. Where, where's my you know, where's the quarter's of quarterly earnings? Whereas the Chinese are naturally strategic long-term thinkers. They think in terms of centuries. So uh, and they're, they're getting even now, or, or maybe that's a poor word choice, but they're responding to the fact that they had a century of humiliation from 1840 to roughly 1949. And now is the moment where they are going to establish the China dream. So they think in those terms. They think in long-term strategic, strategic terms. So the challenge for us is, is a fractured democracy and one, particularly one that's awfully divided at the moment, how can we define a political center where we can agree on actions that we can take that make sense, that conform with our values? We have, this, this is a, I, I think, is a major challenge for the American democracy. Either we can figure this out or we can't. Well, we're a little slow at it. <laughs> I think, I think uh, one more. I'm sorry. Thank you. Hi, Bill. Hi. By the way, this book is fantastic, and we should all review it. Okay, well, we're here for $20. Can you introduce yourself? I'm sorry. Can you maybe I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, no, I'm not. I'm just telling you. I'm just getting into the studio. I'm coming you in. I took Linda to China for the first time in 1994 and 95. We went twice. Right. Press the, actually, just through the NOPC um, project. Anyway, my question is, we know where we stand today, 2019. But as you say, we've had bad policies for a decade or more. What should the Obama administration have done? What do you see as where they missed the opportunity to perhaps um, prevent the situation or reduce the situation where we are now? I don't think you can single out a particular administration. There, there, there's been a consensus from the days of Jimmy Carter and then George Bush. Uh, senior, then Bill Clinton, then George, uh, then uh, George Bush Jr. Uh, through the Obama administration, there's been a consensus that China would emerge in a way that was beneficial to America's long-term interests, that it would be part of a, uh, the world order that we had created, that they would ultimately soften their political repression, that a booming middle class would use the internet to create greater political openings. So no one thought that it was going to put the Communist Party out of power, but that there would be a relaxation, as we saw in Korea, Taiwan, Japan. So uh, I, I don't think you can say one administration made the mistake. It was our, our American scholars, American political leaders, American business leaders, all bought into this vision of how China would turn out. And it's only under the recent government of Xi Jinping that we've seen a, a brand of communism emerge that we didn't expect at all. It came as a complete surprise. He was a complete surprise, and his policies have been a complete surprise. And so the problem is that they can be now extended for another 10 or 15 years. As long as this man is alive, these policies can play out. So we have a major intellectual policy challenge on our hands to figure out how do we respond to what we've helped create. Yeah. One more? <laughs> There's two hands here. Uh, uh. I'm going through a couple more. Okay, very quickly. That's you too. Okay. That's it. Okay. Oh, hi, hi, Bill. Because I just want to Brandon, say that. Yes, that's right. So I want to say that a long time ago, a good friend of mine, uh, Kurt Vonnegut, <laughs> Jr., so Kurt Vonnegut, and he suggested, he said, one of these days, <laughs> and he wrote, I may have written a book about this, including about the, the Chinese, about the invasion coming in little, little forms everywhere. Question. Okay, the question is. Do you know about this? And then it's amazing that it's coming to fulfillment. And what do you think? About what? About his prediction. This is about 20 years ago, at least. What did he say? What was his prediction? Well, that uh, Chinese invasion in a very unusual way. Hmm. And it was interesting because I couldn't understand why he was mentioning like, little little people and little things. So, well, he was right that, that what the Chinese have done has been very incremental. Uh, and very many small steps. So there have not been flashy Pearl Harbors or or uh, 9/11s. Or so he, he he may have had a, a correct vision that predated all our all our uh, understanding that 
the nature of what the Chinese have done has been under the radar screen, step by step, incremental. There's not been no no atomic bombs, no bombs in Pearl Harbor, no Sputniks. It's been consciously crafted that way. Your quote. Right. Yes. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. This is really the last one. <laughs> I'm lucky to get the last question. Um, and so, introduce yourself, please. Yeah, I'm Chris Donghu. I'm a reporter at Yahoo Finance. You made a great point about that how China is good at taking advantage of the worst part of the U.S. system. And we know in China, a lot of people are proud of their system because they believe it has proved to be so successful in some large undertakings in areas like building 5G or building high-speed railroad. And while people saying in the U.S. were struggling with funding um, infrastructures and education, so do you think in response to what China has achieved, does it mean, in to some extent, the U.S. government needs to take a more powerful role in shaping the economy in response to that? Thanks. I think we need to make our system work better. I mean, I, I agree that our system has not worked uh, as well as the Chinese system in certain respects. You know, I saw an article in the newspaper about. Chinese railroads go 300 miles an hour, ours are lucky to go 60 or 70 miles an hour. There's no question but that what China has done uh, in terms of its infrastructure has been spectacular. So we, we need to find a solution that fits with our values and our systems and our institutions. We, we cannot embrace a Chinese government communist system. We cannot have state-owned enterprises. We have, we have to lean down and make our system work better than it has worked, but we cannot embrace wholesale Chinese communism, of course. So that's the challenge to us is, as Americans is to end our endless warfare, our political warfare, and try to concentrate on finding overlapping interests among our institutions in a way that can be more powerful. So I, I completely understand the point of view that the Chinese believe their system is yielding more positive results in many ways, but I do not believe that we need to imitate the Chinese system. I think that's I think that's a wrap. Okay. <laughs>